Hello, and welcome to the official podcast of the Georgia Game Developers Association. The following is part of a series of recordings made during the 2011 Southern Interactive Entertainment and Game Expo. In this session, Eric Church presents Serious versus Entertainment Game Design and Production. While the technologies of serious games are similar to entertainment games, their design and production processes often differ. This session uses the production cycle of both to introduce the differing design and production considerations, funding methods, technical requirements, client differences, and the requirement of working with instructional design and subject matter experts each affect the creation of serious games. Eric Church draws upon his 15 years as a game designer to highlight the process and discuss how making a serious game presents challenges and opportunities not found in entertainment games. The Georgia Game Developers Association now presents Eric Church. Shall I go ahead and start? Yes. Thank you. Just stop. Hi, my name is Eric Church, and uh, I'm a serious games designer for Breakaway Games. And before I get too much into what I want to talk about, I want to tell a little, little story of something that happened about a year ago. I was working on this project called Edge P, and the idea was to create an MMO that was going to train soldiers heading to Afghanistan and who had been in field in Afghanistan. They want to train them about the environment, train them about what sort of interactions they're going to have with people. And they had already come up with a lot of what the design was going to be. They had actually already gone out and purchased uh, a massively multiplayer online engine. And we were brought in to build it. And very early on, I'm looking through the design, and there's a call for this to be first person. And there's a lot of assumptions that go with what's a first person shooter versus a third person shooter and how the, the, the players interact with that game, how they relate to the characters. And we felt that being a third person game was much more important for the kinds of interactions they were interested in. They wanted interactions that had to do with how do I relate to the environment? How do I relate to these other people? And to do that appropriately, a first person shooter, which is really sort of the equivalent of looking down a cardboard tube, it wasn't appropriate. So I prepared this whole, whole speech and put together a bunch of PowerPoint slides to explain to them why they really wanted a third person point of view and not a first person point of view. And I went through this whole thing, big phone conference with the client, and as we're getting on, and I showed a, this, something very similar to this, this is actually where we ended up, but a, a mock-up of it in third person, and one of them said, yeah, that's what we wanted, we wanted first person, we didn't want it jumping around from person to person. We just wanted it attached to one <laughs> character. And what I realized is they were thinking of it in these sort of literary terms of first person. I'm relating to one person, not in terms of what games are. And the important thing that I really, like I kind of had already known this, but it was really a really useful lesson to me, which is you, you really kind of need to understand who your audience is and who it is you're talking to. So before I go on any further and talk about what I'm, going to, what I'm planning on talking about here, which is this process of it, how the processes between entertainment games and serious games are different in, especially the early development, getting a deal and pre-production, I want to know who my audience is. So how many people in here are connected to serious games already, already working in serious games? And how many people in here are connected in, to the entertainment games and working in that field. And so that helps me a little bit. How many people are, are actually not developers but looking to, to deal with serious games as, as purchasers, as, as publishers, whatever, however you want to see them? Okay, great. So that, that helps me a little bit. It's kind of a, a big mix, so we'll see how this works for everybody. But uh, what I really want to do is talk about who I am, sort of some of my background, because I think it kind of illustrates what some of I think you're going to see more and more of with the uh, serious games world and where people are coming from, where the talent's coming from, and where the, the companies are coming from. And then I want to talk a lot about the process of getting a deal, at least the most common ways of getting a deal, and make some comparisons between entertainment games and serious games. 
And then I want to talk some about the pre-production process because I think that's where a lot of the biggest differences exist and where a lot of, you know, everybody knows that's where both entertainment games and serious games tend to go wrong is in pre-production. So, and I, I may get to a little bit about, you know, what, what happens after you produce the game and, the, and what you have to do to ship and install it and everything, but we'll see about that. And I just want to let everyone know, I, I don't know, I've, I've tried this speech out, I'm not sure how long it is, so I, I think I've got time in here, but basically interrupt me at any time if you've got questions, if you've got comments. I'd really like this to be much more a dialogue, because we've got a lot of people in the audience who are at least as experienced as I am, if not more so, who have other interesting experiences. And I really want to get as much of this about everybody talking to everybody, as opposed to just me standing up here running my mouth. So one of the things I want to say is that everybody's experience, and especially seri in serious games, could be a lot different from what I'm talking about here. It's, it's that, one of the things I really like about serious games is I'm constantly getting new and interesting challenges. It's constantly different. The business models are changing constantly. The production process is different. All the clients are different. Every single game I've made so far, every simulation I've worked on has been significantly different. And what any of you may experience or may have experienced in the past could be significantly different from what I'm talking about. So that's that's my little preamble. And now to talk about who I am. I'm, I came from the entertainment world. I worked on a lot of military shooters. I started out at a company that was strangely started by a couple people from the Army Research Lab. So there's been this sort of continuum of, of entertainment and series throughout my entire career. But I spent a lot of time working on these, these military first and third person shooters. A lot of them people probably have heard of. In the Medal of Honor series, I worked on the, the first three, and then I also worked on the first console, Call of Duty. And that's been a really, that was a process that let me do a lot of learning about how you take a world, how you take an existing world and an existing set of knowledge and make it entertaining and make it exciting to people. But it also shows a lot of what's different about serious games and entertainment games, because in the entertainment games, we used the, the world of World War II in particular as a veneer. We weren't too worried about accuracy, we weren't too worried about how it, you know, what it was, the, the, the specifics, and in a lot of cases we were sort of, we accidentally or on purpose, we were miseducated people. We were, there's time, at one point we got a letter from somebody who's, from a teacher, who sent us this copy of a report that was submitted by one of their kids that was the story of Jimmy Patterson, who was our main character in the first couple games, and how he won a Medal of Honor. And it was entirely made up. But this kid had taken this and taken it as reality. Now on the one hand, it shows a lot of the power of what you can do with these games. This kid knew these stories inside and out. He knew a lot about World War II because of these games. But it also meant that, you know, like this, this way that we were playing fast and to loose with the truth was part of what let us do that. And the company I work at is Breakaway. Started out in a similar sort of vein. We Breakaway started out as a entertainment game. They came out of the ashes in the in the Maryland area of Microprose. And if anybody's been playing PC games for a long time, there's a whole history that you know, the early PC games, some of the great early PC games, and some of the very like the the light the, the simulation games. You know, Chopper games and the tank games from the PCs and from PCs in the 90s were put out by Microprose, and we've got a lot of the people who came from that background are now working with us and elsewhere in the in the valley north of Baltimore. But over time, right after they started, they had some contacts with the military, and they were doing some games like helping out putting together war games. Doing a, they put together a system called entropy-based warfare that was used to run war games. And now when I say war games, I don't mean war games necessarily how a lot of us think of them. Certainly, it was a learning process for me because I grew up playing war games. We, I worked at a game place called War Games West, and that was a game place that sold war games, Squad Leader, War in the Pacific, these giant epic board games with little cardboard chips, but those were war games. Now, when you talk about a war game in some other situations, a war game is necessary, it's a moderated process. There's, you get a bunch of people in and they play a game, but it's all a verbal process and then the, the 
actual systems of the game are hidden away, or even just some guy making an arbitrary decision. And we came up with, a, for Breakaway, developed a system called Entropy-Based Warfare that helped to run those, that created some of the entropy that occurs in large-scale warfare. Over time, you know, Breakaway did that and continued doing entertainment games, doing games that were expansions for existing real-time strategy games, city-building games, it's a big variety of, of entertainment games and working in the entertainment business, but the, the serious business continued to expand. And eventually, especially with the, the crash, we decided to, to back away from the entertainment games entirely. It's very difficult to maintain the two, because when you're working with a large publisher, the large publishers expect to be the center of the universe. When, when you're working on a game for Electronic Arts, and Electronic Arts says, no, we want everybody owning your company working on our game right now and make it as good as possible, you don't have a lot of choice. You either do that or you move on. And so Breakaway chose to, to move on and, and concentrate solely on serious games and work, in, work with government, work with corporate training, and, and build that business up. So, What's the difference? What's the difference between these two processes of getting a, a deal in the entertainment world and a deal in the series world? In the entertainment world, there's sort of this official standard method of getting a deal. Is you put together a sell sheet, and if you're good, you put together a, a demo or else a video. You have some sample of what the game's going to look like. You have a design overview, you have some of the technical approach, you have company prospectus that describes what how your company's background is, who your team members are. You have the technical design, you have some analysis of what your competition is. You put all this together and you go out and you start shaping, chopping it around to different publishers. What you're trying to do is get this deal that is going to be an advance against royalties for the game you're going to produce. So in theory, these people are giving you the money that you're going to go then make for them. And it's a little bit broken in that sense. Um, but it's it, the good thing is that you put these materials together, and then you can ship, chop them around until somebody is interested in the product. And you get feedback every time you do it, so you're constantly improving on this one product. Eventually, you will hopefully get a publishing deal. And that's very different from what I experienced once I started doing serious games. Serious games come out, usually there's a request that comes to you. There's a request that's published, most of them by the government is where, is where most of our work is still coming from, although I think it's both because of contractions and, and the amount the government is, is spending and in the growing acceptance of serious games. It's a training methodology that's moving to more of a corporate world, but the process is still very similar. Somebody puts out a request for proposals, and they, in the case of the government, these are actually published on a website. You get to see all of them that are coming out. You kind of monitor for something that's going to match what your skill set is, what your technology is capable of doing, and you put together a proposal that will hopefully get you this deal. And just so you can start getting used to some of the alphabet soup if you're not familiar with this world already, there's, this is some of what you're seeing. You'll see requests for information, an RFI. You'll see an RFP, you'll see BAAs, you'll see SIBRs and, and STTRs, which are a specific strange little world of their own. Um, and in general, you just have to start to learn to unfold all of these different letters, all these different acronyms, because it just keeps going. You're always going to be able to more and more of these to know. Um, I want to walk through a specific one deal that we are specific uh, request for proposal that we came, went through that we were successful on recently, and to give you an idea of the timeline, because that's the other thing that's very different is in entertainment games you'd go out, you'd have a deal, and for the most part you would know pretty quickly whether or not you were going to be able to sign a deal with the publisher. You'd go to the publisher, you'd contact them if they thought you were even worth talking to, they'd bring you in. You do a little bit of focus testing through their company, but within a month or two, you would know if you had a deal. It's been very different for me in the serious games world. Um, this project, I have to see really from beginning to end for the, for the entire proposal process. And this was this project called IARPA Series. Now, IARPA is 
the intelligence equivalent of DARPA, and if anybody's familiar with DARPA, the DARPA is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. They're the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Agency. DARPA is responsible for a lot of the really high-end technology that the, the military does, and IARPA is a slightly more recent invention that they're trying to do the same thing. And they've started focusing a little bit on games and seeing what games can do for us and what games can do effectively. And this was the second of those that they did. And it started out with just a request for information, an RFI. They just said something out saying, hey, tell us what you think is interesting in serious games. Tell us what you think you could do using a game to train and submit a paper. And so we put together a, a response to this RFI and submitted it along with a bunch of other companies. And that process of writing it took a good deal of time, the process of waiting for them to go through all those and read them, respond to them, took a little bit more time. And eventually they announced in, so that, that all started in March of 2010. In May of 2010, they held a workshop. They brought together the people who had produced what they thought were the most interesting papers and had a large round table and we all kind of presented what we had done our research on and we had a lot of back and forth. It was actually one of the most interesting workshops I've gotten to attend in a long time because there was this was some of the like some of the smartest people in games, in serious games and in, in trying to figure out what works about with games. And this this big range of pro university professors and people from other com competitors and we all sat in a room and talked about what these, these different areas that we were interested in. And they sort of categorized everything into one group talking about, one day talking about flow and how flow works. And if you were in the, the previous session, there was a lot of talk about what, how flow works in a game. There's a whole set of us who had, who had done papers that sort of addressed that. And then there was people who were talking about how virtualization works and how people's perception of themselves is addressed by games. And, and how that can shape what they are, what they do. And then there was a group talking about how mechanics can be applied to specific learning. Over this course of this couple days, we did that, and then we sat down with the program director, Dr. Rita Bush, and worked out what some of what might go into an eventual BAA, which is a broad agency announcement, which is a specific form of a request for proposal some of what might go into a proposal to try and get people to mitigate cognitive biases. And cognitive biases are these processes, they're sort of heuristics that happen in your brain automatically. It's a, it's, it's a very uncontrollable process. It's, it's things that, that there are assumptions that you make that you sort of evolved making that at one time it was a matter of being eaten by a saber-toothed tiger or running away. You need to make a product decision really quickly. But now that we're in a modern world, a lot of these are a particular problem, and they're a huge problem for intelligence analysts. These analysts will make decisions based on these cognitive biases that don't necessarily reflect reality, and we end up making very bad decisions. We end up making decisions like, well, we think that's a viable target. It turns out to be the Chinese embassy, not, not a, a Serbian military building. And that, that's the problem that they were trying to solve in this case. And we worked out with Rita Bush what some of the experimental variables you would want to look at trying to solve that, what sort of games could be done for, used for that. And she went away and she said, okay, well, I'll be back, you know, we'll, we'll make a broad agency announcement in a few months, and that will, then, you know, hopefully all of you people will get together and put together some proposals for us. Well, it wasn't three months. It wasn't it was closer to six. There was an announcement of what was what's called an industry day. And this is a day when they, they've announced generally what the broad agency announcement is, or it's going to be, and get everybody into a room to sort of announce themselves, sell themselves, find out about what the project is going to be in more detail, but then also find partners. And that happened in January of this year. They announced the full BAA actually came out in uh, March. So once again, full year between when we first submitted this request for information and when we actually started seeing anything that was going to be work out of it. 
in this long timeline leading up to the project launch, you're not guaranteed of any work at this point and you're not being compensated, is that correct? There's absolutely no money coming to the company and you're doing this all out of, out of your own pocket and there's not even a promise of, you know, the, at the point of the, the first request for information, there's not even a guarantee that it's going to result in, an agent, in a broad agency announcement or a request for proposal. You're doing this work in the hopes of eventually producing work. But yeah, none of it is paid, none of it is compensated in any way. What's that? On speculation. Yeah, on speculation. So this uh, announcement, um, is it possible that it won't even be a job for anyone? It's is that entirely possible. So they may have an idea and like, nah, at the end of the whole. So what, what actually happens internally, what happened internally at IARPA is Rita Bush had to go to her bosses and say, I'd like to get money, and we're talking about millions of dollars, mm -hmm. to, to try and fund this, this process. So it's, it's making these games and doing this research. So yeah, it's, it's... So the agency that you, well, the company that you work for has to have a stockpile of cash or other work or things that keep you, to keep you afloat on these lull, these times of lull. Yeah, exactly. There's, 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 well, and you know, for the most part, no, no one of these deals is going to keep you going. But it is very much you need to be distributed. And in fact, in some cases, there's an expectation that this not be the only thing you're working on. There was another uh, proposal that we worked on for the World Bank that the requirement was that their money couldn't be more than 20 percent of your total income. So they wanted to make sure that they what they weren't the only thing funding. <coughs> So it's, yeah, it's, it's a little bit scary to be doing these, these requests for information, doing these requests for proposals. And putting them together is not an easy process. Um, eventually, the, so the full proposal went in in May. And in August, they announced the phase one winners. And we actually worked on, we ended up teaming up and creating three different teams within our company. We had to do this very strange process. Where, because we're basically competing with ourselves but have found other partners, we had to keep people, but nobody within the company could talk to anybody else inside the company about what you were doing. So we had a, a Chinese were they legally pilot. separate entities within the same building? No, no, it was just different personnel. Oh. So, and you know, some of our, like our accountants still knew what you know, each of the proposals were. And, but the people who were doing, who were interacting between the teams, they had to be isolated other, at least as far as what their workload goes. I mean, we've, we're working with each other on other projects, we're working with each other on other proposals, but for this proposal we could not go to, I couldn't go to my colleagues and say, hey, I've got this idea, let's, let's bounce, this, bounce this around. So that was a little bit strange as well. So out of these three teams, we actually had one success, and the project kickoff is in a couple weeks. So here you are. From early March of last year to October of this year, before you saw any sort of money coming in, and that's a little rough for a business. Um, and to give you an idea of how extensive these proposals are, this is part of the table of contents from the announcement. This is so there's there's probably 50 pages in total, including some of it's old, some of it's very much boilerplate where it's you know. You've got to put together your the things to control foreign nationals or making sure that you're not hiring illegal aliens. But a lot of it is actual content that you or other people on your proposal team have to put together. So this is content as in as in, in the work? you're going to the the proposal that you're going to submit. Okay. So the proposal was actually limited in size. There was two appendices that had to be 20 pages. There was and then the full proposal had to be 20 pages in addition. So we're putting together 60 pages of really crafted, good writing mm -hmm. for something that may not see any money. And we actually did three of these. So these, all these, these requests for proposals, they, they tend to follow a similar format. And whether or not they're coming from someone like IARPA or someone like a corporate client, where they'll sort of lay out a goal of what they want to do with this, with this product They'll lay out some vision, and in a lot of cases, that vision is very specific. They have exactly what they think they need to do their training, to do their education. They'll have specifics in how they're going to deliver it, and what their budget and timeline is sometimes. Sometimes they'll publish their timeline 
sometimes people think that there's some advantage in keeping the, the budget secret. Um, and then there's going to be, usually going to be a series of project phases. And what the project phases are is there will be a series of sort of go, no-go decision points in the project where you will get to the end of phase one, there will be a hard evaluation and there's no guarantee that you get work after that phase. So depending on the project, that may be three months out of the total year project, it might be a year out of a four-year project. So a lot of these have a lot of common problems. And now we're going to get to a little bit of a rant of mine. But so they have, like, you know, I talked about this problem early on where I was talking, you know, I described talking about a first-person game versus a third-person game, giving this whole spiel. And they were talking in very different terms. A lot of times these proposals will have very hard terminology in writing that you're responding to, but you're not sure if you're responding to what they think they say. It's the, the line from Princess Bride, I don't know if that word thinks it is, that means what you think it is. And there's also a problem of being in love with technology. They think that if they have some specific technology, it's going to solve their problem. It's going to make their serious game engaging. The biggest problem is that people think that 3D is better than 2D. That every time, if I can do this in 3D, it's going to be more effective training. That people will be more engaged. That it's going to get the kids to play it because it's in 3D. And in fact, that may or may not be the case. And in a lot of cases, you're dealing with a budget that doesn't really support 3D. You're talking about a budget of maybe a few hundred thousand dollars. You know, what you would, would have made a game in the early to mid 90s for. And they're expecting it to look like a AAA game that's out now that you would make for 20, 30 million dollars. And so there's this process of, of trying to, to tell them what you're going to do to, with their work, how you're you know, responding to this proposal. But you have to do it in a way that that tells them they may not be right, but gently. And that's, that's an ugly, ugly process. There's also uh, a tendency to try and hide the budget. Not every time, but some people really want to keep that budget hidden. They're hoping to get people to start bidding competitively and underbidding each other by not telling you how much they have to spend. But as all they're really doing is depriving you of information about what it is, that, what their expectations are, how much they're looking to spend. So in other words, if you saw it to be a $10 million job and you bid, bid it accordingly, they have a $200,000 budget, you may be wasting your time. So it's always best for you to have kind of an understanding of what they're looking for as budget and their budget restraints. Yes, exactly. So. How often is the occurrence in this space, uh, I would get it for a very little period of time, of uh, companies to say, we can do this for five million, oops, we're gonna need another two million to do it, but you've already already spent five million, so you should probably give it to us. How often is it for companies to like deliberately underpose and then run over budget? I think I saw a lot more of that in entertainment. In entertainment, there was a degree, of, there was sometimes a feeling that you could, if you could get in and get the company sold on it and they started marketing it and they started selling it up to their customers and potential customers in the entertainment field, that when you get to that point and realize, oh, oops, we can't possibly finish this for the amount of money you had budgeted, they get you more money. In a lot of cases with the government, it's a lot harder. The contracts are pretty strict. There are, you know, we, we hear on the news about all these people getting lots and lots of extra money out of the government. I haven't found it happen once. Is there that you have contractual obligations? You're either going to meet those, or you're going to fail, and they're going to stop paying. And so and they'll never use you again. Yeah, that's right. So you don't want to fail. <laughs> I, I, I work in that same space, and um, we have like we have money up until this date, and once that date hits, we better be ready or they're not going to pay us to support it. They're not going to pay us for an upgrade for this new feature, this new vehicle, they'll take it to somebody else. So the reward is that they'll give you more work, but once they run out of money, you're out of money. And like, I don't know of any way you can convince them to give you more, just like for fun. Like, <laughs> can we have more just to make it cooler? No, you can't, no, it's too much for tape. Here, uh, when you mentioned the comparison with um, AAA games, I've seen, and I wonder if you've seen two two opposite poles uh, there, pulling in two different directions. One is 
there are clients for serious games who feel like AAA game mechanics or aesthetics are negative because they will detract or distract from the learning agenda or the serious agenda. They're, they're crossing on a cake that doesn't need crossing. And the other is they're so in love with the AAA aesthetics and mechanics, but they don't have the technology base in the company and the organization to support that. They don't have a pipeline. Well, and yeah, that's actually one of the huge problems you run into. Is people want they want 3D, they want this this very advanced looking game. And oh, by the way, we're doing it on business desktops from about four yeah. years ago. Yeah. So you're trying to you're really the, the, there's no way you're going to be able to meet their expectations on their machines. So you're either delivering something that makes them sad every every single time there's a product review, or you're delivering them something that there's never going to work for them in the end. And I don't know what the answer is. I mean, the, the other thing you were talking about, that, that people wanting, thinking that there's that it's just icing on the cake, that it's not necessary. I've never run into that. I actually, I mean, that's that's not been my experience. I mean, I know you... you there's, I, in a review of research I did a few months ago, that came up quite a bit. And training managers, for example, feel that to the extent the game is in, engaging as an entertainer, it is undermining the serious uh, purpose of the game, both in the mind of the player or employee and the organization that manages it. Yeah, and now that I can see. That I can see. I thought we were just talking about in terms of, well, this looks too good. No. Now, that, there is some times where you're kind of trying to manage that process of it. Give them stuff that, especially if it's if it's temporary art early on, the the people you're dealing with don't under, understand the process of making games as well. So they'll they'll look at stuff early on, and you want it to be very rough. There's, if anybody's had seen um, in expression, I'll get you in a second. If anybody's seen an expression blend, there's sketch flow, and they actually have a, a mock-up process that has all of the pre-made art, all of the buttons, all of the text is done as if it was hand drawn. And it's a brilliant way of expre expressing to somebody that this is temporary. So mm -hmm. it, the button looks temporary because it looks like somebody drew it with a pencil. And all the, the text looks temporary because it looks like somebody drew it with a pencil. So there's not this, well, yeah, but it's a little too blue. <laughs> because they understand it's temporary. But that, that process is very important in dealing with the customer. Um, about that specifically, in connection to his question, um, it seems like if 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 the value of the thing in 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 the case of like this a, a, a training simulation is to teach a task, then maybe the aesthetic um, or the aesthetic in Sketchflow. I mean, it serves a particular purpose. I mean, in Sketchflow, you know it's temporary. That's the intent of it. It defocuses the emphasis on perhaps certain aspects and refocuses the emphasis on other aspects. We think of AAA content, what is our value add? What is their focus that we're focusing on? We're focusing on the, 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 the uh, immersion aspect. Um, and, and that's the, but the immersion aspect in a, in a visual sense um, and, and maybe a tactile and other kind of thing. But, but maybe the immersion aspect in a simulation perhaps is, is what is the quality of the game mechanic? Like, you know, if, if it is to teach a particular um, way of building an engine, then it might be nice if it represents exactly what the engine looks like uh, from a AAA standpoint, but it might be better if it's more technically accurate. I uh, would know that this bolt is here and has this many threads, you know, for a mechanic. So, in, in, and when I've done, when I've either, you know, used or done something with simulation, I am more thrilled I could care less whether it's like blocks of color from like 1990 and it's just all, you know, bland. But if it's technically accurate, that gets me excited. And so, maybe it's what is the value add? We say the AAA versus other things. But um, but have you found? And the question then is, uh, have you found over this course of time um, that certain that certain elements can be defocused and other elements can be focused on and have some? There's always trade-offs, right? In a matter of investment. And, I mean, I, I, what it was received. Yeah, and, right. and I've got I've, I've got a whole other associated rant about the, the the power of abstraction, and that's one of the things that games do really well is they abstract ideas, is they can present a very complex idea as a simplified form, 
and that applies to the visuals as well, and, and to any audio and any interactions. Is, there is a lot of value in doing something that is simpler and a lot flashier, a lot less flashy. But getting, like, communicating that to a client who really wants it to look like the game on their son's Xbox is very difficult. And I, and I, I know there's, there's people in the room who've gone through the same process, and I don't know if, if anybody else has ideas. Like, how do you go through? <laughs> Run. No, um, I did have a two part question. The second one is, is concerning what you're saying there. But the first part is what's your, uh, since you're in this space, that routinely deals with government type of contracts or whatever you want to call it. What's your what's your fail pass ratio? Is it one out of three, one out of five, one out of six? I'm just uh, on the top of your head. I mean, just to get a ballpark for understanding a company who does this all the time, how much work it takes to actually fulfill a contract from a business business aspect. I mean, when a contract or fulfill it? Winning or yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're talking about winning. Yeah, well, let's start with winning. I'm just trying to get a just a, just a ballpark understanding of, you know, it's probably about maybe one in ten. One in ten. So you yeah. put that much work on each of these, and you'll get one out of ten. Okay. The the amount of work that goes into the contract, you 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 vary it by by how much. And and as a designer, this is an exhausting process, but it's also fun because yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I'm spending my company's money. I I'm getting paid. Yeah, so but your company's okay earning your company's it. earning their money back from that one out of ten. Right. So all that time you've lost, they need to make up for that in order to. Pay. Well, that's the government rate. The yeah. company is also bidding on non-government things. Those things can have a different rate. Okay. Well. And that's that's been better. And the government rate's gonna 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 go down. Yeah. On court because there will be less. Many targets of your company. Okay. I think the other thing is we've got a couple of DIR moments in the US that it's a big surprise to me because we're a studio that's done some stuff and then we did one in DARPA. And the mm-hmm. big surprise to me was the amount of work after we got it to comply with military and, and government <laughs> regulations with respect to having our camera system on it and setting policies and procedures and the form. It's a, the regulator does a ton of this work and they have a lot of people that are very, you know, uh, experience in this, and they're just outside of Washington, and I guess the whole business on that. I think that's the one caution I would have for anyone else in this. Is this is not for the fame part. <laughs> no, um, right. you have to have a lot of process in place. Yeah. It, but um, it's very, it's very hard to get it, and the, the requirements. It's not doing the job for us was the easy part. Mm-hmm. But the monthly reporting, the filling out the forms, the understanding the acronyms, the payment systems, mm-hmm. and all of you know, that. Thanks so on the, on the same note, the non-government contracts, I uh, hear it's a higher ratio that you guys are picking up, like one out of three, one out of five. I'm, I'm not sure off the top of my head. I find it to be one out of three to one out of five, depending on, depending on how you are defining that, that the, the denominator, like how, how much the traffic you have coming in. The more traffic you com- have coming in, the lower the hit rate is going to be because it's likely you have too many, you have, once you get a, above one out of three, one out of five, if it's because the, if it's because the amount of incoming is going up, it, the, the average will go down because most of that, in, most of that extra incoming is, is essentially people who are kicking the tires and aren't serious about spending mm-hmm. to begin with. So the biggest problem, and this is something Breakway is good at, or Dave is good at, is is you have basically about one conversation to decide whether this person's worth any further investment. Right. Yeah. You have to turn your head off. That, that, a, that yeah. takes a skill to get used to. Right. And the second part of the question was just kind of continuing the conversation about um, if they're expecting a triple A or X amount of work, how do you personally deal with softening that blow, that communication? Because I think any and any studio owner, such as myself or, or some other company owners, run across and they have their own <coughs> methods of dealing with that. And mine is not to deal with it and find a client that understands the price break, whether it be a website, a game, or whatever, having a reasonable, that has to have a huge budget, but it has to have a budget that's gonna sustain the project. But that's just me. So uh, there might be a schmoozing way that, with a gene that I don't have, you know? Some of this really comes down to something that it's not so much a business side problem as a problem for the, the production team. Is 
you know, as a designer, you know, my, the trick is to describe, like, I still have to put together, I'm putting together a design document, and I want that do document to explain to them exactly what they're getting. So the level of precision that I have to put into a design document and even into a proposal is, is higher because you need that, you, you, you can't make any assumptions about what their knowledge level is. And the other place where this becomes really important is concept art. Is concept art will get you a deal in the entertainment world. Is if, if you have good enough concept art, when I was at when I was at uh, at Spark, we had one artist who was amazing at putting together these beautiful paintings that described what somebody was going to experience, and they captured it really well. Beautiful full color things that really like you looked at and you knew what the, what was going to be happening. I told the whole story and. You almost see, you, you need to be very careful about what you're showing somebody who's not familiar with, with games, who's not familiar with this process. Um, i to get back on track a little bit so I can get to a little bit more of the pre-production stuff. Um, the, the other side is, you know, from, the, from writing these proposals and from trying to put together a design for somebody, the, the biggest issues that, that I run into that seem to run into, that cause me problems with actually getting these is, is not a, you know, when you're looking at these proposals, you have to go through and build a checklist of everything you want. Pull everything you could possibly, everything that they're looking for and create this checklist and make sure you answer every single issue that they've raised. You can't sort of dance around issues because you won't get the deal. The person who addresses everything they were asking for won't get that deal. And then the, the weirdest one for me, just coming from entertainment to, to serious, is a giving them references, giving them actual academic references, and you know, doing all the proper formatting. It's you know, going back to, to college and, and remembering how to write a, an appropriate report, and also this, this sort of this process of building up a whole collection of references that you can use to sort of say, this is why you want this game, this is why you want this approach, that have academic backing. Um, the other, some other minor things that, that show up is partnering. I discussed the, the IARPA BAA. That was, we were working with a bunch of different partners. Having an appropriate partner, having a partner who can fill in the gaps that you're lacking, especially for some games, some products expect you to provide the subject matter expertise. So finding people who can provide that subject matter expertise becomes really important. Um, so I think we're running a little slow. I was going to do a, an exercise where I had some of you try and put together an idea for a game, but basically something is at least as a thought exercise. Think about what you would do if somebody was requesting something as dry and dull as a game to teach restaurant inspectors how to how to inspect restaurants. And the the challenge that inevitably show up with something like this is. It's not going to be a big budget. If you're talking about something for states, you're talking about a very small amount of money, so you need to figure out the most efficient and interesting way you can present a, a problem of how is it that I, how do I train somebody to, to recognize what's a viol food violation and what's not a violation? How do you present as much of that content as possible? So, but, uh, who's that? So, Assume you've gone through this whole ugly process of getting this deal, you've gotten a, an entertainment deal. At this point, entertainment deals are structured very differently than the, seri than the serious games and the, the corporate deals I've dealt with. There's a tendency to do a sort of a two-stage process that, that is much more, is, ends up being much more useful. That you have an initial contract to sort of put together the the game design document and the technical design and put together concept art and create enough that you could create a contract and then you have, then that create, that becomes a much more concrete statement of work. In, in serious games, most of that is done in that initial contract. That's going to change. I can hope so. I hope no, so. It's, it's, it's got to because it's, it's it's, you know, we, we, in some of the previous sessions, we've talked about this, this that one of the things that's most important that, that serious games can most learn from entertainment games is this process of, of killing your babies, of figuring out what works and what doesn't, and then abandoning it. And you have this strange process right now where 
your ex all of these features, like specific features, specific gameplays, is is described in the initial contract, and you have you know if you want to get change that you have to go through a whole process of changing the contract, which is just broken. And so if anybody has any way of negotiating out of that, and, and you say it's changing, it's it may change. We're we're um, there's some people within the federal government at the executive level. Uh, as well as some of the agencies that have been advised to get this changed, and they're looking into how to fundamentally change it. And I, I'm just saying, if you're working with a, a corporate client, you know, it's, it's sort of a similar problem. You want to make sure they understand that they're better off if things are less concrete. Keep in mind that that for corporate contracts as well, and even the government, less of government, but corporate contracts. Um, they're usually not worth the piece of paper they're written on past the third paragraph that says we have the right to kill this work at any given time with 30 days written notice. So to the extent the corporate client is asking you for all that, the funny thing is they'll kill your thing in pre-production anyways. Um, so, it's, so you might want to actually excuse that to explain to them why, hey, let's have this first contract because ideally it's, it's better for you to be able to, to get a cleaner second contract. Because that one will matter. Sort of complementing what uh, Ben said, it's also, I think, uh, for those who are getting into corporate work, very difficult to manage a client to their previous, previously made commitment. If they change uh, personnel in the project on their side, or if they change other factors, getting writing a change control that increases their costs or lengthens your schedule is it's much harder than you might think it is because you've got a contract that you thought laid everything out. Usually when that happens, my experience is the project just dies. Once once somebody is brought in to change at that moment, that's a huge probability that the project's going to die. A positive conversation going on. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> So the, these are the, the pre-production for, for on the game side and, and ultimately to some degree on the serious side. You're, you're looking to produce a GDD, a, a game design document, a technical design document, an art bible, which is something that you don't see in, in serious games and I really think could benefit a lot of them, which is really, it's a process of, of finding out what the style of the game is, of, fi of describing visually what, what the general look is. So people are looking for specifics and instead what, what we really need is something that, that is much more general, that, that sort of, this is the look and feel, this is how things are going to be, and, but some of that's also hopefully getting to a, a more stylized look. I mean, I know, like, Muzzy actually gets, gets much more stylized than some of the stuff we have, which I'm jealous, so. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the differences in, in serious stuff is that when you're doing a, a GDD for a serious game, you also have to start taking into, into account learning objectives, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And some of these sort of standards and methods of communicating with other systems. And this is mostly a technical problem, but there's definitely design considerations and some kind of, what I consider sort of, in some cases, fun design problems, but they're design problems of doing a, a serious game that don't come in, and most of those have to do with learning management systems, and in the case of government contracts, integrating with uh, HLA, which I'll talk about. That was just the last bit of this one. I was just suggest one thing we've added, you probably do in your game design document, but we spend the first two weeks in the kickoff with a client doing business requirements, and it's probably the kind of thing you said, you know, their definition of first person versus your definition of third person. But that whole, what's the use model Where's this going to get deployed? What systems does it have to talk to? Uh, what, are your, what are your expectations for it? All that jazz. So, strangely enough, that's, that's what we do in our starting with the kickoff. Um, before, I, I just wanted to make a quick note about like this is one of those terminology things that's gotten me into more trouble than just about anything else, which is the term storyboards. Which, if you come from an instructional design background, a storyboard is that. It's an exact description of what is going to be happening on every single screen, including all the text. And if you're coming from a games background, that's a storyboard. It's generally what's happening. There's a lot of filler where, yeah, text will go here later. You should probably think about this. This is the kind of interactions that are going to be going on. 
And it, it's really illustrative of a much bigger difference, which is when you're doing a game and you're planning for interactions, there's, you're, you're planning for interactions. You're planning for something that's going to be very dynamic. And if you're talking to people from a, a learning background, they tend to think in this sort of static way of, okay, here's the frame and every content of every page is gonna be changing a little bit. And so it's, it's mostly when you're communicating with people with instructional design background, you wanna think about that and plan for that because those people could easily be involved in your project. In a lot of ways, they should be involved in your project. So the, the start of the whole process is a kickoff meeting. And this kickoff meeting is a meeting between you and the client and it's an opportunity to really dig into what it is, how you're going to be doing this. It is, it's the communication process, who you're going to be talking to, who gets approval, but then it also is like starting this process, this laying down what things mean to each side and starting to establish what the, what the learning objectives of this game are. It's, it's really the, the first big chance to, to dig into the meat of the project. Um, and one of the things that, that needs to be communicated to people who are not familiar with games is what, what it means to change stuff. It, it, as a designer, I mean, designers are, you know, we, to some degree, we're notorious for, for coming up with random new cool things to do or wanting to change things. But that's, in the case of, of dealing with clients, they may want to change stuff, and it's very dangerous. Now, the other side of this is getting them invested in getting them invested. And there's something, there's a, a quote from Jesse Shell that I really like to, to go to at these points, and I actually think is completely valid, and, which is, that everybody working on a game is a game designer. And that includes the people on the client side. Is everybody is making meaningful decisions about what the game is, and that means that they are designers. And, as, and as speaking as a designer, I tend to get, you know, we all tend to get a little bit defensive of our territory because we have this sort of undefined role of we're designing games. And as much as game designers need to get over that on an entertainment game because everybody's got good ideas, it's even more important because in the case of serious games because you're trying to get these people invested in the process and get them to understand what they're doing. And that means you have to you have to make them passionate about the process of design. Um, so that's that's always my little spiel that seems to help. It's not perfect. So um so, kind of over that. Now talking about consultants and working with consultants. When I first started in games, and when I've been working on games, a lot of these military shooters, that was my idea of a consultant. You may recognize that man, that's, that's Dale Dye. If you've seen any Steven Spielberg movies recently, he's had some bit part. And he's also Steven Spielberg's big military consultant. And he's really good at his job of making people feel like they know about military stuff. And he's a, he's a He's amazing at that, and he will actually, you know, we would go through as designers and artists working on Metal Honor games, we went through boot camp, and it was a one-day boot camp, but he would pretend to yell at some people, and he would pretend to make people do push-ups, and it kind of got that experience. And when I came into serious games, I thought that's what you did when you were working as a subject matter expert. You really need, you know, you talk to these people, and they gave you a feel and you started capturing it and you were done. And you were done working with it. Now, in serious games, it's a very different process. There's this enormous amount of communication you have to do with the subject matter expert. And as a designer, there may be other people who are working with the subject matter expert. The instructional designers may be working with the, the subject matter experts, but the, the way that design and subject matter expertise interact is really, really important and really difficult because you need to get all of the information out of these people to specifically recreate their world in a way that is believable to them. And there's a, a problem that, that I see that, that, that is everybody familiar with the, uh, the Uncanny Valley? So I think that there is a similar problem to the Uncanny Valley with domain-specific knowledge is the, the uncanny valley, people, you know what a real person looks like, and as you get close to a real person, but not quite there, they start looking really hideous. It's really creepy. You know, it really remembers uh, 
the, the Tom Hanks movie, except now I can't remember, Polar Express, where they had nearly perfect people, but they were sort of static and, unex and expressionless, and they were terrifying. The entire movie, based on a children's book, was terrifying. And the same thing happens in domain-specific knowledge. If you get somebody who is an expert on repairing ships and show them a process that, of what you do and show them that process partially, it will drive them nuts. And it will be that same thing of it doesn't look, it's close, but it's not there, and so it's really inaccurate, really difficult. And so the process is important to go through, this process of extracting this knowledge. And it's going to be an ongoing process because you get the first burst and then you kind of have to spit it back at them. You get another burst. And as a sort of illustration, um, I'm not doing much time. Okay, then. I won't go through that. <laughs> I was going to give an example of working with a subject matter expert, but something that to try to try for any designer. Sit down with somebody else and imagine you're going to be making a game that is about using vending machines. And sit down with somebody else and try and get every piece of knowledge that you need from them into out of what you would need to make a vending machine game. So it's not just Oh, okay, I walk up to the vending machine, I put the money in, I make my selection, and that becomes my thing. You have to go into, okay, so if I put my money in, but I don't put in enough, how do I know? What's the feedback? If I put in too much money, what happens? If I make the decision, but the product is out, what happens? How do I make that decision of what product to get? What knowledge am I, do I need displayed at me? And if you go through that process, you can start figuring out exactly how you would want to do that with a subject matter expert. And given that I only have a couple minutes, I'll, the other thing I'll say is before you ever talk to them, research their field. <laughs> know as much as you can before you ever sit down with them, because otherwise the, the first time you talk to them is wasted. As, a, as an aside, tell the client that you need time to do that, because sometimes they want to throw you in the meeting with them right away, and they, they have no concept that you want to show up prepared to be able to talk to them and interrogate them. They think that it doesn't work that way. And so you, you want to tell the client, yes, I'd like some time to go read, could you write a reading list? Um, because you don't get, sometimes they don't give you that option. So I, I managed to not quite get to nearly enough of my design content. I apologize to any designers, but I covered a lot of stuff. So um, questions, comments, anybody? I'll, I'll just say one of the most nitpicky, especially if you're doing military contracting, some of the most nitpicky people you ever see are soldiers. Like like soldiers that are on the field, especially if they've been deployed at all, they will tear apart every little detail of your game. Because they have nothing else to do, they're just playing your game and then just criticizing it. So that's probably the most critical subject matter I've ever worked with too. And, and that, that uncanny valley problem, the domain specific, is particularly bad with soldiers. Because they're not even, like, that's all they've been living. Yeah, it's everything. For four years, they've been cleaning their gun, and then all of a sudden, the spring's in the wrong place, and they're pissed about it now. It's it's awful. A uh, question about money. Um, in the entertainment world, I assume that you are fortunate enough to have a successful product. You will get revenue from that for a lengthy period of time, right? The money will keep coming in. That that's usually the theory. Now, <laughs> that's not what it's worth. I try to caveat that as much as possible. But in the, in the games world, there's no such thing as royalties, is there? There's no such thing as residuals. If you are successful, you deliver the product, and it gets used by whoever it's intended for. But your revenue has a hard stop at the point of delivery. Well, and that's it's something that's actually that's sort of true but not because if you're successful, if you've made them something that's good, that serves their purposes, they want more. And they want more of the same thing and more in more detail. And that's something you have to think about when you're building your tools, when you're designing your tools, when you're planning for what it is you're going to be making as far as you know, how you're going to be using doing your production process is if you plan this as a one-off and they come back and they say, we really like more, it's really painful. So more than even making entertainment games, the tool side has been really important, and the design of tools has been really important. I have an exciting comment. Um, 
exciting quote for that. Successful projects are never completed. Only failing projects complete. Because if it completes, it's, it's done. If it's successful, people want more. So I heard that one time, successful yeah, projects. Right. That's great. We, we found if, if you're transitioning into serious games, you have to understand that although they may come back and want more, the same timeline applies for funding all over again, potentially. Yes. Just because they want more, they don't have funding. You have to go to different agencies, other, oh, now it's a real project. Oh, well, that's got to be funded by a completely different organization. It's a whole start over again process, and it takes a long time. I think also there are a lot of potential for different business models than work for hire to come in, because they're going to take radically different organizations at the development level, as well as um, different approaches to, to the way the targeting works. But I would argue that the most successful serious games vertical in the world is Exer Gaming, and that is entirely royalty-based for some of those developers. Um, and it's entirely consumer-based, and it's, you know, I wouldn't mind having a, 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 a dollar per copy of uh, EA Sports Act. So I think that there's, there's opportunities. The other thing you can look at is, is whether or not there are applications of your tools and your engines and negotiate into the process the ability to have those for other projects and, uh, and, and get that clarified in your contracts. What's the re reusable right of the technology investment you pay? Um, it's not always amortizable, um, but if you can, then you have an opportunity. One thing I might mention if you're talking about government contracts and you know the if you end up with a successful completion of the project, the company still has the IP for that the intellectual property to that, although the government has certain rights to that product, even if it's developed under government funding. But if there's a viable product that comes out of that, then of course then that can go out and be sold on the public market yeah, to other groups as well. It's not just exclusively kept to the government marketplace. Yeah, the, the fantasy, although I think they, they stopped trying to support anything like this, there was the case of Full Spectrum Warrior, where they a company got paid to develop the serious game, and then they turned around and made sold it as, a, as an entertainment game. And not a bad entertainment game, and reasonably good at teach, teaching squad tactics. So. I think they kind of won on all points, but that's less. There's there's less ability to do that in a lot of cases. Like some some of these, like a lot of what you do, ends up going into open source. So you, you're required to make it open source, or certainly open. It's always available to the government. So once you've made one thing for the government, they they always are allowed to, to use that. Well, um, earlier you mentioned like I've always grown up like knowing that it's hard to get. Um, the actual contract, because um, like my dad's a contractor, and so I started doing that. But then um, I was curious once the contract is attained, um, what is the success rate, uh, like producing a good product? Uh, the, the grant I, I've been working on with the uh, uh, university I, I attend, we produced the product to fit the somewhat vague terms of the contract, but it wasn't what some of us would consider, but it wasn't as successful a product as we would have liked to have. Um, produced because of some difficulty with um, SMEs because for some reason they couldn't give us any of the soldiers that we needed to talk to for an entire year. And so um, I'm just curious, like, what is your experience with, um, I guess, the success rate of a product once um, you, have, you have that contract? Well, I mean, so it, using your, your quote about what success is, if success is continued work, it, it's it's probably about 50-50. Success is getting it done. I mean, you always get it done, yeah. but is it good? Because in a lot of cases, you do. You have either you have problems dealing with you know getting contact with the subject matter experts, or the, the biggest problem I've actually seen is getting feedback back from them. So you get contact with them, and you give them a bunch of stuff, and, and you, you, know, you pull a bunch of information out of them, and then you get back to them, and you say, here we go, here's this, what do you think? And they go, and they because it's a giant pile of paper. It usually, you know, they they won't look at it. It's, it's getting that process. So I actually, this is something we put together recently for a client where 
we were doing dialogue trees, and they're these hugely complicated dialogue trees because it's a soft sales trainer. And it's, this is what I had to do to get feedback out of them. Because if I gave them just dialogue, if I gave them a Visio file, they couldn't look at it, they couldn't, that, that understanding what it was was really difficult. But if we printed it all out, taped it up on a wall, and started taking notes on it with them, that got the feedback, but whatever it is you need to do to get that feedback, and or to get the contact, and if you can't get the original contact, like, yeah, that's that's the nightmare. So, since you mentioned Visio, I've got switched over to personal brain uh, mind mapping tool to do what I used to do with Visio because it allows you not only to make much more complex charting and relationships between pieces, but you can also go online and edit with your clients from a remote distance, so it's a really powerful program for the same type of purpose. But not if they can't see. I mean, that's the, the, the thing about this was this became, this put it so, it's a very visual process using any mind mapping, using Visio, and I'm, we were dealing with experts in sales, and they're not visual people. So we had to make the, the, the visualness of it as explicit as possible, and that was the advantage of doing this. Or They're whatever. not screen people either. Um, we've done the same technique with clients. Say, why don't you print it out, put it up on a wall, and look at it, and we've gotten better feedback. The other reason, the question though, if you're using Visio, I'm assuming that you're also embedding data in those, so that that file is going to go directly into. Uh, we're actually using a different tool to. to but that does that so it, it's 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 similar. To, this is not a direct import. That, that's that's the plan right now. It doesn't, but that's my hope. But it was as much. I, I find at least as a designer, having a visual representation of what I'm trying to do is really important. And but for me, on a screen, it worked. Right. Yeah. But for the client, it wasn't. Isn't isn't this isn't this akin to the entire exercise of the serious games that we're talking about? This is a serious exercise. Okay, this design process, interaction and communication. Um, and, and the achievement of an achievable task, which is to complete that document. Okay, we have many tools that are available to us and most of them fail uh, fabulously. Um, and, and, to, and so I think in this, in this image, we see that, okay, this works. Why does it work? Well, because it, it can represent more what we're envisioning. So imagine that if this wasn't pieces of paper on a wall, perhaps this is a simulation environment where that's a virtual wall in a virtual environment, but you can get the same visceral feel uh, in that virtual environment in VRML, 3D perhaps, or something like that, where he and the client remotely, perhaps, and there may be things, projects that already do this, but, um, but remotely perhaps could interact on that wall together uh, and not be co-located. Um, and that itself would be a training for the achievement of what kind of process uh, 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 um, completing a dialogue. And, and that could be, you know, a simulation or a serious game to do what? To, to teach the task of completing an interaction dialogue on a virtual wall in a virtual environment. Um, so, I mean, all roads lead to Rome, right? But I think that, I think that that, I think that this is the, the key point is there's some things in our world that are very difficult to uh, visualize and achieve the goal that we're trying to achieve. Uh, but we have a lot of tools which fail us. Uh, Visio, Visio and uh, Microsoft Office, so a lot of kinds of things. Um, and, and this is this is why we're here, I think. Um, I, I have how to, do we do that? So in, in military context or industrial or in business? Uh, maybe at some point, but I think what you're describing is actually one of the great dangers of this idea that, and it was on one of my earlier slides, but there's this idea that virtual is a game. And that's such a dangerous and bad impression. Okay, okay, so, and I, yeah, maybe you so can that's, agree with that. So, if I were to make a game about building dialogue, I would not do this in a virtual environment. I wouldn't. That would not be good training is I would find a much better way to do this. Because I don't think, you know, this is this was an ad hoc way to deal with the problem, mm -hmm. and it was great, but for anybody who's had to do a conference in Second Life, 
<laughs> exactly. So beyond the half hour it takes you to get try and get into the conference because it's supposed to be saving you time and a phone call would have happened already. Beyond the, the fact that, that one of the guys has shown up as, as a blue dragon, beyond the fact that <laughs> beyond that, any of that, it's it's the virtualization is not the virtualization of the right thing. Is is if I wanted to do a, a virtual conference, ultimately go to meeting with a couple of shots of somebody's faces is vastly more effective. And there's an important lesson for games in that, which is that it, you can't just take a concept, virtualize it, and pretend you're training. You have to actually distill what's important out of it, turn that into something useful, turn that into a process that is engaging, and, and use that. So. Um, I created a game called The Day in the Life of a SME, which helps me make my first initial relationship with them. So it helps me let them know I do understand how busy you are and that I still need your time. Can I borrow it? <laughs> <laughs> mm. So I think we're, we're now well over time. So. Good job. We hope you found this recorded session informative. If you're an established or aspiring game developer in the state of Georgia, we invite you to become a member of the GGDA in order to participate in our monthly networking and educational programs and to experience Siege firsthand. Information on becoming a member and attending chapter meetings can be found at ggda.org. Information on Siege can be found at siegecon.net. Thank you for listening, and we hope you'll come back for the next episode of the Georgia Game Developers Association's official podcast. Music for this program was provided by Professor Shy Guy. For the GGDA, I'm Cecilia Holman.